Well, I want to welcome you guys. We got more folks coming. Boy, I tell you, this is great. It's okay to start a little bit late when you've got folks joining. Come on in. I would tell you to have a seat, but something tells me you probably already have. If you've got something that you're enjoying, some coffee or a glass of water, some juice or something, I encourage you to take a drink with me as we start our, our class this morning. I prefer coffee, so I enjoy that, but just want to say a few things this morning as we get started. Got some more folks coming in. It's exciting. Sharon King. Sharon, it's great to have you here this morning. Um, thank you, everybody, for being with us this morning. I did what a what a wonderful day to be together. I can't explain or say enough about what a wonderful day today is and uh, what a glorious day to start this class, to start any class, really. Um, it's Easter Sunday and, and what a beautiful morning it's been. I don't know, uh, for those of you who don't have young children, you may have not gotten up too terribly early, but it was a beautiful sunrise this morning. And uh, ours still hunt some Easter eggs and enjoy some of the the, bunny, the bunnies deposits, if you will, and the, uh, it was a good time that we had. Um, one thing I want to mention real quick, uh, we want to make this a, a really great environment. I'm going to add some more folks here. We want to make this a great environment, and I love feedback. I love to hear uh, things from folks that can be done better, and uh, uh, I want, to, I want you guys to, to let me know how we can make this class better, either by sound or sight. Uh, this was the first time in about a month I put on a, a white undershirt and a dress shirt, so it helps me to uh, uh, be in front of all you guys to, to look pretty decent. Um, I had one, one of my favorite elders said something the other night after Mike's class. He called me a hippie and I need a haircut. Uh, but you know, I can't be like Brock or Chris McMillan or some of these others who just keep it clean all the time. So uh, uh, I appreciate I appreciate your feedback. Um, we've got some special, all of you are special guests. We got some folks from all over joining us. Uh, I got my aunt and uncle from Texas are on here. So talk about pressure. Uh, I've also got my grandmother's on here. So I tell you what, if I seem a little off today, it's just because I got some really special people watching and I really don't want to mess up. But I'm really glad that you guys are here and uh, it's great seeing everybody here on this screen. I have the luxury of seeing all you guys as I talk and it's really great. Um, but look, what a, what a great day to start this class, right? What a wonderful day. Easter, uh, just, just thinking about our risen savior on the third day and, and spending some time this weekend, and I hope you have, uh, reading through some of the, the scripture that, that talks about his death and his resurrection, and, and it's really an amazing weekend. And, and maybe one of the greatest parts about this weekend is our chance to not only think about that, but think about what the resurrection means um, in the time that we have for this class. You know, it, it's, this has been a, a really interesting month or two or however long uh, this is going to be. And it's, this is a class that I wanted to teach. Oh gosh, I was thinking about it earlier this morning, probably for a year or more, um, and started talking to John Waterston and some of the others on the adult education committee. Because community has been something for a long time that I've thought and dwelled about, prayed about, and, and have enjoyed the benefits of. Um, but also there's a lot of challenges to what it means for Christian community. And uh, Add another person real quick. Jessica, come on in, we're glad you're here. But community is something that I've been thinking about for quite a while and what community means for you, what community means for me. And it, it's almost amazing the time that it came about to teach this class. It's almost amazing um, how in God's time, I was set to do this class well before any of this 
coronavirus, any of this epidemic really got started. And, you know, I honestly wasn't thinking too much about class. Um, come on in, Parker's glad you're here. I really wasn't thinking quite candidly too much about class uh, because of work and everything else that was going on until about two or so weeks ago. And I thought, oh yeah, I'm supposed to teach class about Christian community. And so I talked to John and, and floated the idea to the elders and um, you know, I really appreciate everybody supporting this. And, and as we start a class on a sunny morning, kind of like our, our regular in-person routine, and I thought, well, if there's a time to do a class about Christian community, maybe this is a good time. And so, you know, this is a, such a, a wild time for all of us um, being apart. You know, here we are virtually on this screen looking at each other and looking into each other's homes um, as we're drinking coffee, just enjoying one another virtually. That we are really at a time of, of amazing historic proportion of so many things coming together at one time. And if there's all these things that are coming together, there's one element that probably has sort of been um, torn apart. And that has been our sense of community, our sense of, of what we have that binds us to our jobs, to one another here at church, to friends that we've got in other places. Um, you know, it, it, it has been um, something quite amazing. And uh, Rosa, Rosa Farmer is joining us by phone. I want to make a, one quick pause here. I got something special in the mail yesterday from Rosa that's for a lot of people at church. She made some really awesome masks. So she made some homemade masks that I've got a lot of. And so if you're interested, holler at Kelly and we'll get those to you, but they're awesome. And Rosa's joining us by phone. So I, I meant to have those to show everybody, but Rosa, I really appreciate that. And, and you're really special and appreciate you doing that. Um, but our, our, our sense of community has been torn up. Our sense of community has really been, uh, been damaged in a way that maybe we didn't anticipate. You know, there's times that we get sick or there's times that we're ill or times that we travel and we're away. That here we are as a church family, thank God that we're well and that we're healthy and that, you know, our needs are being met. And at the same time, we're apart and, and it's really, really challenging. Um, got the McKays with us, glad you guys are here. Uh, got the Rampies, glad you guys are here. But you know, our, our communities have been diminished. Our, our, uh, the, the ties that bind us are, are really stretched, if not sort of torn. And that's really hard for us to, to handle right now. It's really difficult for us to piece together what was so easy and what was so simple in that our travel and our work and everything that we had. Um, for those of us with children, it's hard for us because uh, for Kate Noah, as an example, um, swimming for Kate was totally just ended. Um, one day it was postponed and two days later and totally ended. And, you know, that's a sense of community that we have with that team and, and, and what those events are. And with Owen, it was um, the beginning of baseball, one of his favorite sports and the team and our kids' sense of community, our sense of community, your sense of community, our sense of community at Falls Church. And it's hard right now to figure out what in the world community means. Um, with so many things, even we're able to say hi to our neighbors, but you know, maybe some of those folks that we're really close to, it's the whole phrase social distancing. It's hard because sometimes you wanna get a hug, give a hug, shake a hand, and here we are wearing masks and doing so much to stay safe that all these things that have been so simple have become so hard. Um, you know, what the question that I think that I wanna start with this morning, and I wanna lay the groundwork um, with you guys all right now as we kind of begin this framework for what this class is going to be and what I hope that it be that it becomes. You know, all of these things are your identity, my identity. I've talked before, you've heard me teach classes about um, my title and, and my job that I do. I look across the screen and I see so many of you 
who have so many different kinds of titles and so many different roles. And they're all amazing. You all do amazing work, uh, contribute amazingly to our church family. And sometimes we, we, we kind of coalesce around those things. And it's hard because our communities are largely developed by our own activity, our own independence, our own desire to be or to do or to, or to contribute to something that we enjoy. And right now that independence has all but ended. It's an independence that's all about essential, essential travel to the grocery store or other kinds of things. And so largely our independence and our identities have been put on hold. And that has been a struggle, I think, for me in a lot of ways. And it may have, it could be a struggle for you in a lot of ways as well. Um, you know, one of the things that, that I can see on this screen, I think about so many ways that so many of you have been limited. Uh, I see Dwayne, you know, he spends time here and goes home often to Kansas. Um, in his role, he's literally not able to travel. Now you get in his car, he can travel home, but it's really hard for him to get home to see his family. And his independence and his ability um, has been severely limited. Our travel in and around Virginia and Maryland has been severely limited. For those of you that are older, you're staying home because of your just personal safety has been limited. And so all these things, all these, all these luxuries perhaps, or all these elements that we've enjoyed for so long have now laid to bear so many things in our hearts and our minds about our identities, about our faith, about our worries, about our fears, about so many things. And this class, I hope, will be a way that we can talk about those things in a way that you start to be built up, that you start to become uh, the Christian and, and the believer that God knows that you can be. And that's really the challenge that we all have in this is how do we grow in these times? How did Job grow in the time of significant loss of friends, of family, of possessions? How did Elijah grow when he was so despondent and just wanted to end his life? How did Christ grow? How did his disciples, how did his apostles, the list could go on and on. And the, and, and the items of suffering from cover to cover of the gospel of God's word is of people who are suffering, who are trying to figure that out, who are trying to understand things better. And we see so many times and so many examples of Christ showing grace and mercy and patience and kindness as people are figuring that out. And when I wanted to do this class, when I wanted to start this class, I'm going to be honest with you. I'm going to be really candid. And I try to do that every time I teach. I wanted to push the envelope pretty hard because I really wanted us to try to think hard about what Christian community really is. What Christian community means to you and what it means to me is different. But on the whole, the idea of Christian community is something that God established. The idea of a community of believers is important. And if there's anything that I've learned, and I was telling Kelly this the other night, late at night, maybe one of the times when I could actually uh, stop for a little bit from work and the chaos that kind of has been the, the stuff that I've been doing and, and Ashley and some others, Mark, I know Mark's listening and others who've been on the Hill. I mean, the, the chaos has been different for everybody. So not to, not to diminish anybody's work, but you know, it was hard there for a long time to just get a shower every day or every couple of days. And um, yeah, it was just everything that was going on. But I told her, I said, you know, one thing that I've come to realize, and, I, and, and perhaps maybe when I wanted to start teaching this class, it was something that was important to me, if you will, is how wired we are, how God created us for community, how God created his kingdom to be centered around community. Often in the Church of Christ when I was little, I remember hearing a lot about forsaking the assembly. You know, and you think about just that being only when the doors were open at church. And I know that when I was younger, in my 20s, in college, you know, I wanted to rebel against this idea that my faith was centered around going to church. But I will tell you, as I've gotten older, at the ripe old age of 39, I have realized more and more that forsaking the assembly 
is about the necessity of community. It's about the necessity of other believers. It's about the necessity of that, that element that God created for us to give us as one of the greatest components of his grace. When Adam and Eve were in the garden, think about the community that they had with God. My goodness, how glorious was that? I mean, seriously, you're Adam and Eve, you have the garden, you have everything. Everything is yours except the tree of knowledge of good and evil. The community that the Jews had throughout the entire Old Testament, he didn't want them to intermarry. He wanted them to have a wonderful, special community. When you think about uh, just in the first century, how they came together, selling their possessions, contributing to the common good. It was a community of believers. It was a community of Christians looking out for one another. The first century church, as they were established and as they started to do things to encourage the, the formation and the growth. And as we even think about the Easter, Easter Sunday, whenever, when Christ is, is risen and, and sharing that, that, that message of hope of, of just an eternal home, part of it was the Great Commission to go and to spread the gospel to all nations. And he wants people, he wants you, he wants me, he wants all of us to be in that community in heaven again one day. And so we are wired for community. We are built and made to be a part of a community. We're not all uh, have the capacity to, to be around a ton of other people every single day. And that's, you know, quite literally not what I'm talking about. But our community of faith, our community as believers is one of the most special things that God has given us. And it's been important to him from the beginning. And so I hope that as we get into this class, that you start to think about how you view your community of faith. All of us here at Falls Church. Some of us are remote. Brock's up in Wyoming. Uh, my aunt and uncle are in Texas. My grandmother's in Arkansas. Um, our community of faith isn't just being about the place that we're in. Rosa's down in Arkansas too. The community of faith is something that is special to all of us, everywhere we're at. And we're doing it virtually, and this is a wonderful community that we're seeing right now together. You know, we got to see some of you yesterday, and, you know, quite literally seeing one another in person was joyous. It was happy, and it was awesome. Just like those who couldn't believe it on Easter Sunday when they saw Jesus, they, they, didn't, they didn't believe it. But I've just been thinking the last few days how awesome it is we're starting this on Easter because Christ, who was a central part of that community in the New Testament, when he died, their sense of community was, was shattered. It was broken. They were despondent. They were sad. They were hurting. There were so many things about that community that they felt like was falling apart. But they didn't get it. They didn't realize that it wasn't just about Christ, even though Christ was a central figure in, in this entire story that we're going to do this, this, this class. They didn't realize that it wasn't just about Christ. It was about one another. And when he came and they saw him, the joy that they had, I mean, it's just, um, if it was like what some of us got to see each other yesterday, you know, when we all get together, some of you probably got my email and if you didn't, I'll forward it on. We're going to have a big party when we get the all clear. We're going to have a big fun time. And we're going to see each other. We may have to have masks on, but we're going to hug one another and we're going to have a great time. Because that community that Christ established, even though he went to be at the right hand of God, was a special community for you and for me and for all of us. And that's what I want this class to be about. So as we do that, I want to get started. Um, I've got some slides that I want to show you um, as a part of uh, our beginning study. And um, I want to uh, do this in a way that I sure hope works. And it's not, let's do this. Oh, I found that bad. Christian community in a time of crisis. I wanna tell you a side note, and you see this really wonderful blend of colors. Um, 
a really neat story I saw in, in so many of the days blend together a week or so back. I believe it was in Europe, maybe England or Italy or both. As the virus was really spreading, a lot of kids uh, started putting in windows uh, pictures and drawings of the rainbow. And it was a beautiful uh, clip I saw that showed just how much um, the rainbow was emerging as a symbol of hope. And I thought that was awesome. Uh, obviously, there's been some changes to, to what the rainbow means in some ways, but I thought it was a beautiful reminder, not only about the story from Noah about God's promise, but just a symbol of hope. And I wanted to use that this morning and in this. But here are, the, here are the tenets of what I want this class to be about, about finding strength in faith, fellowship, and our identity. Faith, fellowship, and our identity as Christians. Um, you know, the loss of community is a, is a significant part of, of all this. Um, as my slides catch up here on technology. Bear with me. It's gonna work, it's gonna work, I promise. Oh man, there we go. Like I was saying earlier, it was really established by God from the very beginning. And not that it's ever ended, not that, not that our, our sense of community was um, necessarily ended by God. I, I don't want you guys to think that. How community has been impacted over the, the millennia, if you will, has been because of sin. It's been because of the brokenness of this world. Um, the sin in the garden led them to be cast out of the garden. They were, they were cast out uh, from the presence of God. I, I you know just how hard that must have been, how, how, how just shattering it was. You know, and the Jews, and when they messed up, and, and God had to put them in the desert and wander for 40 years, but they wandered together. They wandered together as a people. He never broke them up, you know. He didn't, he didn't do things that, that made it more difficult. But we see a lot of micro components of how community was shattered because of sin. But then we see things in the New Testament, and when we think about um, the establishment of the church and first century believers, all of a sudden, it was because of sin that community formed. It was because of sin and, and challenges that our community was established to be even stronger. Um, so the creation of community. Um, it's important that we look at and, and have a basis for how we're going to start this class. As my slide catches up and technology obviously is uh, going through a lot of growing pains these days through so many people zooming and conferencing and whatever else. Um, I wanted to use the, the start of this class. If you have your Bible close and if you don't, I'll read it. We're going to be in Luke chapter six, chapter six, starting in verse 12. And I, I thought this was a great place to start because Christ is, is taking time. Uh, to talk to his apostles, to talk to his believers. Um, and uh, he, he starts it here. And there's, there's three significant, there's so much in this. And next week we're going to get into this more detail. But there's three major parts of this that he goes through. And we're, we're going to start this today. And, and one thing I want you to try this week, we're all socially distancing. We're all kind of at home. I hope you'll spend some time um, this week reading over this passage. And I want, you to, I want you to do something sort of for fun, but I hope you'll do it in sincerity and, and in genuineness. I want you to figure out what category you're in. And as we read this, there's two kind of big categories that Christ talks to some of these folks. Um, he, he has an equal number of woes and blessed ours. And I am curious where you think you stand. Next week, we might have a little survey at the beginning. Uh, one of the great features of Zoom is that you can do surveys and do some chat functions. And I hope the next week have more where you guys can send in questions or comments. I want to make this as interactive as I can. But I want to read this. And for those of you that are listening, be happy to just listen along. Verses 12, and I'm going to go through 38. And it was at this time that he went to the mountain to pray. And he spent the whole night in prayer to God. And when day came, he called his disciples to him and chose, and chose 12 of them, who he also named as apostles. Simon, who he also named Peter, 
and Andrew his brother, and James and John, and Philip and Bartholomew, and Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas the son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. And he descended with them, and stood on a level place, and there was a great multitude of his disciples, and a great throng of people from all Judea and Jerusalem, and the coastal region of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him, and to be healed of their diseases, and those who were troubled with unclean spirits were being cured, and all the multitude were trying to touch him, for power was coming from him and healing them all. And turning his gaze to his disciples, he began to say, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who hunger now, for you shall be satisfied. Blessed are you who weep, for you shall laugh. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and cast insults at you and spur your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets, but woe to you who are rich, for you are receiving your comfort in full. Woe to you who are well fed now, for you shall be hungry. Woe to you who laugh now, for you shall mourn and weep. Woe to you when all men speak well of you, for in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets, the false prophets. But I say to you who hear, love your enemies, do good to those who hate you, bless those who curse you, pray for those who mistreat you. Whoever hits you on the cheek, offer him the other also, and whoever takes away your coat, do not withhold your shirt from him either. Give to everyone who asks of you, and whoever takes away what is yours, do not demand it back. And just as you want people to treat you, treat them them in the same way. And if you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. And if you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. And if you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. But love your enemies and do good and lend, expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great. And you will be sons of the Most High, for he himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful, and do not judge, and you will not be judged, and do not condemn, and you will be pardoned. Give it, and it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, they will pour into your lap. For by your standard of measure, it will be measured to you in return. If there is anything about that section, there's three significant things. Number one, the blessed and the woe. And my screen hasn't caught up, so I'll work on that next week. I'll read from my other device. (laughs) Part of it is blessed because there's a group of people there who are um, who are downtrodden, who are hurting. Um, They are uh, hurting, and they are uh, in pain. Honestly, Um, They're blessed because Christ says they're blessed. He's making a point that their suffering will be overcome. Blessed are you who hurt, who are hungry, who are said horrible things because of me. He then goes on to admonish those who are, well, I guess it would be easy to say a little more privileged. For those of you who laugh, who don't have concerns, who aren't hungry because you've got enough to eat. He goes on to say, woe to you. Now, what's striking to me, and then we'll get into one of the parts there at the beginning, but this is kind of the meat of it, because he's speaking to all of us. He's speaking to you and me and everybody on this on this call and on this, this class. He's equally telling them, you're going to be comforted, and woe to you. He's speaking the same thing to everybody. He's telling everybody the same parts of his sermon, of his lesson, because they're all on an equal footing. And notice in the words at the beginning part, where it says that he went to a level area. 
It wasn't like he was preaching down. He wasn't on a hillside and they were below him. He was speaking to them. He was giving them the tenets of what Christian community is like. He's giving them so much about what it means inwardly and outwardly. But it's also really important to note that just the, the strength that, that Christ had to have, he spent all night in prayer. I don't know the last time you spent all night in prayer, but I can tell you the last time I did it, and it's never. <laughs> um, it's, I can't imagine praying all night, but he did. The entire evening, he spent in communion with God, in community with God. He spent the entire night praying before God, and he went and picked his apostles after doing so. Now, there's the key part of this section. It's not the blesseds. It's not the woe to's. There's an important part. And if I had my screen, it would be fun. I had all sorts of cool animation, but even in the age of technology, it doesn't always work. But I want you to think of what that key part of that entire section was. The prayer is so critical. We're going to talk about that one week. The woe to and the blesseds are important because there are some of our body who are blessed are you who mourn, who weep, who struggle, who hurt. And there are some of our body who laugh and have plenty to eat, figuratively speaking, of course. And we're all in that same place together as a body. And if I had the screen, it would be, you know, the key part of the section and any guesses, it would be a big bold letters across your screen right now. And it would say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. In that last part, Christ spends an equal half, if not most of it, and it goes on where we stopped, where he talks about the importance of love. He talks about the importance of what loving all these conditions, all these things, all these components, how important that is to this community, internally and externally. He comforts the afflicted, he challenges those with status, and commands all of them, all of you, all of me, to love. And he goes on to say all those things, that love is the most important part of all those things. He goes on to tell a parable, but those are the things that we're going to focus in. We've got five or so minutes before we do our thing and, and visit maybe in our houses and get ready for church. We're going to get into some things um, about this class that is what this next slide would have been about the challenge to this section that we read. And that challenge is themselves. If Christ could have just told us that we need to love everybody and do all these things and kind of went on his merry way and back up to heaven without all these things, we would be great. But we know when we read through the Bible, when we read through, you know, all the elements of grace, he gave us the garden, we kind of messed it up. He gave us the Jewish family as a whole, and we kind of messed that up. He gave us the Ten Commandments, and quite literally, when he's coming down from the mountain, they're worshiping the golden calf. He gave us ten things, just ten things, and we messed it up. And throughout it all, we see God's grace every single turn. When we mess up, he rebukes us. We get punished. We're disciplined. But God's love is everlasting, and his grace is always there. And the challenge for these folks at that time, even when Christ was praying to them, was themselves. Having to tell them, I want you to love each other. I want you to love your enemies. I want you to do these things. Because if we could do it, we wouldn't need it. If we could do it, we wouldn't need the Ten Commandments. If we could do it, we wouldn't need Christ. If we could do it, we wouldn't need the Holy Spirit. And yet, every step of the way, God gives us these things because he ultimately wants you and me and everybody on this screen. I can see Ella. I can see Sam. I can see all of these wonderful people. He wants each and every one of you, Kate and Owen who are upstairs, miraculously being quiet. He wants all of us in heaven. And one of those things that he's given us, one of those things to help us get there, to help you get there, to help the Jews get there, his apostles, his disciples, Mary Magdalene, all these folks, Paul, Timothy, Silas, 
The list goes on. What he gave each and every one of them was a community of believers. So in the next few minutes, I'm going to go over some of the things that we're going to talk about in the next several weeks. I hope that as the weeks go on and things change, that we'll be able to do this in person. Uh, but next week, we're going to dive into more about this call to discipleship. And what when, when Christ was talking to everybody, he was giving them the parts of what discipleship really means. And he was going over those things about love and and care and all those sort of things. We're going to get into the Christian identity in two weeks, over a two-week period of time. We're going, to, we're going to cut pretty deep about what the Christian identity really is. And again, current day events and other activities that are going on, I think, are going to make this a little easier for us all to kind of think through. As I heard something the other day, a sermon that I heard, is in times like this, that if you don't feel the immense joy of God's love or the depths of pain and hurt, because of the challenges in the world around us. It's times like that maybe that you don't necessarily feel or experience the true love and grace of God because it is enough. And these events that we're going through as a group, I think are helping us all see and feel things that are really there and the challenges and the little things that are in us. We're gonna talk about generosity and time and relationships because community cannot happen it's almost impossible for community to thrive and to flourish and to be rich and wonderful if we don't put the time and build the relationships for it to happen. We're going to talk about our heart, our hearts as idol factories. And right now, there's probably a lot of idols that we all have that we never knew. Idols of fear or anxiety, hate or anger, frustration or other things. You know, sadly, I've seen reports that, you know, sales of alcohol have skyrocketed and there's all sorts of problems. You know, these things were there in, in our hearts as man before this really came around. And it's hard. If I was in front of you, and as I'm trying to wrap up so that we don't run into service, if I was here to tell you that I've been joyous and happy for four weeks, I would be the biggest liar you've seen today. It hasn't been. It has been hard. I have wept. I've cried. It's been overwhelming because the, the enormity of what has gone on is significant. And I've seen the fears and the things in my heart, and it is hard in these times. But we're going to talk about our hearts as idol factories. Over a two-week period, we're going to talk about sin. Of course, we're going to talk about sin. This is the Bible, right? But we're going to talk about it as slavery and as self-righteousness. Because sometimes we think we can do it all, and we've got it all right, and we're doing all the things and crossing our T's and dotting our I's. But at the end of the day, we have to have others and we have to have God as well. We're going to talk about grace. We could talk about grace for a long time. I used to do a class on grace. I did a class, not used to, I did a class on grace. Um, you know, we could spend an entire another uh, semester, if you, if you will, on that. But we're going to talk about forgiving grace and enduring grace. Forgiving grace of one another and the enduring grace that we experience from God that's important for you and for me and for our community of faith. And just like Christ spent the entire evening, the entire night in prayer to God, we're going to talk about prayer towards the end. So I want to read something to you guys. And I, I think I can, I think I can keep it together. It was really awesome. And I sent some of you this earlier in the week. I want to leave you with this because it, it's, it's amazing when we think about, um, what community is and the gift of community here on earth. As I'm sitting here looking out my windows on Lumsden, I see you guys all over the country. And as he spoke, he no longer looked at them like a lion, but the things that began to happen after that were so great and beautiful that I cannot write them. And for us, this is the end of all the stories. And we can most truly say that they all lived happily ever after. But for them, it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world and all their adventures in Narnia had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chapter one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever, in which every chapter 
is better than the one before. We are a part, and as we wrap up, we're a part physically, we're a part physically from God. On this Easter Sunday, we're celebrating his resurrection. But the community of faith that we'll have one day, that's what we're working on right now. That's what we're trying to perfect through Christ. We're trying to perfect through his grace. We're trying to perfect through his gospel. That that great story that no one's read, that's going to happen one day in heaven. That's where we're going. That's where we're headed. On this day, on every day. I think we're about to start our worship. I'm so thankful that you joined. I'm so glad that you've been here. Let's all spend some time together in worship. Have a great day. Thank you guys very, very much.